Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Brian and Jesse show. We are back today. Are you ready to do some talking? Let's do some talking. <laughs> and uh, first thing I want to talk about is these new boots you're sporting there. Boom. Those things are awesome. Are you a little jealous of those boots? Did you kill that ostrich yourself? I did. I went out, strangled it, and plucked it. Not strangled it, because you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about not strangling <laughs> what you eat in a minute, right? No, these boots, I walked in Make to a walk. favorite boot store, and guess what the name of these boots were? Uh, Prometheus. The Jesse. The Jesse. And I knew it was meant to be. Those are those are heavenly boots. I took them home with me. I felt like God gave them. They to were me. prophetically named from they the were. foundation it, of the world by it, the Lamb <laughs> for your life. God it, said, upon this foundation, I built my my Jesse right Personal here. prophetic word right here. Word of knowledge. I love that. And the boots, ostrich. when I saw it was like the Jesse, I was like, Listen, if you wouldn't wear a white ostrich, you're not American. You're definitely not Texan. <laughs> definitely and you're not. you're no friend of mine. No friend of ours. I would drape myself in white ostrich head <laughs> to toe. I'm talking boots, <laughs> pants, britches where I come from, britches. jackets, and even, even a cowboy leather white ostrich cowboy Ooh, hat. Ooh, what if I had a white ostrich skin you need one. baseball cap? Dude, I'll tell you what, we will club mm. an ostrich tonight. Yes, Start we will. Start tanning that hide white, getting it ready to go on your beautiful head. <laughs> Let me just tell you something. Ostrich is life. There you no, go. I love ostrich. We uh, we do like a good animal skin. And if you don't, um, you do not want to come to our house. You probably don't want to come to the state of Texas. Probably not. Yeah, and that's okay. Kentucky. That's okay. We don't care. You know, there's all these Californians moving into Texas and they're like trying to bring their, they want Texas to be what Texas is, but then they want to like infuse their California-ism into yeah. it. I say, stay back where you came from that was already wrecked without your ostrich skin and leave the Texans alone. That's you know, what I say. Speaking about where we're all from, I'm a Kentucky boy. I, I consider my, I'm, Kentu I'm a son of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, but I love the state of Texas and was coming, I came here all the time as a kid. Well, the so, prettiest women live in well, Texas. Well, I'm married to Texas. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I will say I'm a Kentexan. That's kind of kind of my personality. Okay. But I saw this meme. One of my friends put it up the other day. And it said, when people ask me what Kentucky's like, and it had a squirrel <laughs> with a knife, and he's on the back of like a, a, cotton, a, mouth. a cotton mouth, and he's stabbing it in the head. <laughs> and I'm like, if that's not the most Kentucky thing I've seen this week, I don't know yeah. what it is. The right? squirrels don't wait for the zombie apocalypse. They stab that blade in that head. They, they get after it. When it needs to happen. They yeah. don't wait for, for such things. So. Amen. Yeah. Well, enough of this. Tom Foolery. <laughs> Enough of these I, shenanigans. But my boots are epic. Your boots are epic mm -hmm. and they're made for walking. The Jesse. The Jesse. Yeah. Uh, we're going Thank to Thank you talk, for noticing, by the way. I noticed them. I love those boots. Let, let's talk about uh, entry points into the church. Okay. All right. Entry points into the church because uh, we live in a world right now, we're, we're Christian pastors, obviously. Uh, if you haven't watched a show before and you thought you were watching a show on something weird, uh, depends on where you're from, but this isn't like... You know, this is a this is a, a church podcast from pastors to people out there coming into the church right now. Yes, that's what we're talking. And about. A, and one of the pastors turned eighty this week, which is why he has so many glasses on his body right oh, now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, have, I have my reading glasses. I have my sunglasses. Yes, so my eyes you probably have some glasses in I your have pocket. Some bifocals in my pocket. Absolutely, Just and I'll tell you what, them out. I don't care. No, I, I don't care at all. Like, I love I'm, it. I'm, I'm grow the gray beard out. Let's go with the glasses. Um, you're doing great. I, I'm, I'm like, I want to look like a hillbilly pastor Santa Claus is kind of what I'm going for. But uh, I feel yeah. like you are hitting it on the mark. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hitting it. I like to hit if when I'm going If we could knock out. a tooth or two out, it would probably help. But. Well, these are fake. Oh, so, okay. So, so we can get about easier we got than a bridge I thought. right here. Don't smoke meth, kids. Uh, all right. So, so all I got to say is uh, entry points into the church. Yes. All right. Bringing people on board. We're in an America that's less Christian than it's ever been. Absolutely. In the history of this nation right now. So... So people have less of a Christian worldview. Uh, they know less about the Bible. They know less about Jesus. They've spent less time in church and with church people. That's right. So they need, like the Blues Brothers said, is you need some churching is what they need. <laughs> we call it being house broke. Yeah, house broke or, or, or getting some churching or, yeah. or knowing what to do, right? Yeah, well, because, I mean, you don't know. Like, first time, like, if you go into a country club and you weren't raised around a country club, you don't know the rules to the country club. 100%. If you go into a biker bar and you weren't raised around the biker bar, 
you don't know the rules to the biker bar. That's right. You know, when, if you're not a Gibson, not raised a Gibson, and you just marry in, there are a lot of things you have to learn to be a part of that tribe. we got a code. Oh, yeah. There's a code of ethics. And every group, but the church is so far removed from the world in general. It, it is so different because kingdom's completely upside down. The kingdom of God's completely upside down. Yeah. So no matter where you've lived in the world, if you have not been, you know, kind of steeped in Christianity and church, it's, there has to be an entry point for, for you to come in. And I think God wanted there to be because he didn't want people to feel as outsiders. But there is that awkward entry into church where you're like, I'm learning, I'm trying to figure it out. What am I doing here? You know, I heard someone say the other day, you guys, he's like, you come in here, you can be one of us, but you can't change us. And they said, this is our spot. It's all we have left. We're Christians. We love Jesus. We love each other. We love the Bible. He said, you have everything. You've got the government. You've got schools, the education system. He said, we can't go to Disneyland anymore. Doggone it. We're just ticked off every time Target's mentioned. <laughs> yeah. He said, leave our church alone. And it's true. You know, you don't, everybody, for years, people were trying to make the church more worldly. And I, and I think that is off beat from we what were, we the kingdom is supposed to, to be like. We were trying to make church cool. I think we were and trying to make it. our generation did that. I'm 46, yeah. you're 26, uh, you know, or, or maybe a little older. 42. But our generation did that and uh, making church, um, trying to make it cool and trying to make people as comfortable as they could be. Until the gospel came to That them. was our take. Until the word of God, the spirit of God, or the gospel made you uncomfortable. Although some churches just went to make people comfortable. Yeah, and they never got to the gospel part. Yeah, they never got to the uncomfortable. The gospel is supposed to make us uncomfortable. It's, everyone should be uncomfortable when the gospel is preached so that they're con because it's conviction, right? And and then it then Jesus comes to them through you, that. As a sinner, you shouldn't be comfortable in church never. the whole time. Never. Right? You have to be converted. Yeah. Brought into the kingdom, and then you have to get your mind renewed. You're going to have to repent of a lot of things. You're going to have to alter some behavior, right? The church isn't going to change itself to make you comfortable. You you don't, uh, Jesus isn't going to change himself yes. to make you comfortable. He's the God, we're the man. So we change ourselves to try to please Jesus. That's yeah. what we're doing here. But there's, and I think there are some cultural things, you know, that we just like that aren't really biblical, well, that sure. really don't matter. But there are some biblical things that should bring conviction and they are entry points. And that's what we want to talk about today. hundred percent. I like the illustration that you hit a second ago. I want to go back to it. Okay. You talked about if you show up to the country club, you don't know the rules. It's going to be weird for you and it's going to be embarrassing. Awkward. And and, and take this from a, a golfer, right? I, I, I used to be a real golfer, started back the, this last year. Um, You've enjoyed getting back into I've it. I've enjoyed playing golf again. So, yeah. so as a, as a kid, my dad was avid golfer. Played almost every day, and I played a lot. Uh, wasn't ever a great, great, great golfer, but probably played lowest uh, about a ten handicap, right? Eight to ten. It's probably about as low as I ever got as a handicap. Uh, but in college, she and I went to school in Tulsa, and I got a job at Southern Hills University. University. Uh, no, Southern. I was at Oral <laughs> Roberts University. Yes. And I was working at Southern Hills Country Club. Thank yeah. you, love. Uh, and so what I did there is I helped run the cart barn. I caddied. Yeah. Right? It's so We had the U.S. Open there. It's big time. Probably one of the Great top, country club. top 10 country clubs in America yeah, wonderful. From, from my perspective. Uh, I mean, you don't get a U.S. Open unless you're big time. And uh, eventually, before I left, I worked there three or four years. I started training the new caddies for them. Uh, because I knew golf. I knew what clubs to hit. I knew how the putts broke. I, I knew what. I loved it when you had that job. Because you made so much money. <laughs> <laughs> I made a ton of money, Kathy. You, I think you made more at that country club than you did the first five years we were ever pastoring. Well, 100%. Yeah, we, it's were, like, we were living the high life. Yeah, yeah. It was we like, were going to like the regular movie instead of the dollar movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had big money. Well, sometimes, I mean, you know, you, I, I would carry two golf bags, one on each shoulder, Caddy, for two guys at a time. And uh, I it's would not do called it. Southern Hills for no reason. I mean, they're hills. It's a high, and, and yeah. it's hot in the summer. And so I, I would do that, you know, around walking like that on Southern Hills, four and a half, five hours. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, a lot of times, I do it two times a day. Yeah, thirty six holes, a bag on each oh, shoulder. Oh yeah, you worked. I mean, I got, I got uh, in shape, but they paid me too. Yeah. And the more they would drink, the more they would tip. Yeah. Right? So it's like as as a Christian and a, a preacher, a pastor, you know, I had this I had this theological tension where I'm like, uh, you know, this guy's probably drank enough. They want another. And there's part of you that's like, I hope he has another because he's going to tip me bigger, you know. And so <laughs> you were dealing with the conviction. devil and the angel on my shoulder. Yeah. Uh, but you, you learn a lot about etiquette 
at a country club. Absolutely. When you're there. And, and these things aren't aren't hard and fast rules in the church world. Church folk uh, should have a lot of grace for you coming in. Yeah. But I'll say this. I, I did this at a country club in Texas recently. Just to show you, you show up to play golf at a club, you got to have a collared shirt on. That's right. Right? Yeah, you need to have golf shoes on. You you can't wear cargo shorts. No. People do, but you look like a knit, right? And, and, <laughs> What's and, a knit? Uh, whatever you want a knit to be. A knit, <laughs> a knit's like a goober. It's not good. It's not good. No. Um, you, you're you're going to need proper golf attire. You're going to need your own bag of clubs. Yeah. Right? You got to know what to do. Uh, shirts got to be tucked in at old school clubs. That rule's kind of going out the window a lot of places. Okay. West Coast golf. Uh, not, not enforced at as high of a level. So I walk up at this country club in Texas in, uh, I'm in Amarillo, right? So I go up to the club kind of funny cause I'm on the range and they're rocking ACDC. Like they're playing like Thunderstruck. I'm like, what are we getting ready to play football? Are we playing golf? Are we going into a cage fight or what? They're getting you pumped up. Yeah. Get me all pumped up, which sends a mixed message versus a traditional country club. Yes. You know, Angus Young screaming Thunderstruck on the goal, on the driving range doesn't necessarily say to old school country club. Yeah. And I had my shirt untucked and uh, one of the members walked by uh, and said, hey, man, you need to tuck your shirt in or the pros going to come out here and get on to you. And of course, I, I used to help work at more, you know, I, yeah. I was a part of one of the largest clubs in America work there. I know the rules. I said, well, if your pro wants to put that kind of feeling to this club, he needs to turn Angus Young off out here on the practice facility because he's sending a mixed message. Yeah. He's making this a golf club and not a country club. He, he's, he's mudding the waters. How would I know? But it's no problem. I'll tuck yeah. my shirt in. So we say all that. They had this same problem, all right, in the Jerusalem church. And what happens is the gospel comes. It's a comes. cultural clash. There's a cultural clash, right? Uh, it, it's like it, it just this clash hits all at once. Two cultures. Yeah. Right? Because you, you've had Jews living a Jewish way. Yes. And you've had non-Jewish people living a non-Jewish way. But now, now there's a way for these Gentiles, which is exactly what we are, to come in, right? And, right. and now it's like, okay, you've got them, but now they have all these cultural things and they are not churched. Yeah. Like we need them to be churched in order for this to begin to mix together. And this great explosion arises and they're trying to sort it. You know, they're just sorting, just trying to come up with the most important things. They say, we should probably focus on some really uh, important things as they come in and make this as easy as possible to grasp and wrap their brain around. So it worked like this, right? Jesus obviously is born a Jew. Yes. Uh, redeems those from the Jew. His disciples are Jewish. Right? The Holy Spirit falls on the church day of Pentecost. They get empowered, right? Empowered the Holy Spirit. Church is born. And then what happens is God reveals to Peter that he wants to win the Gentile church outside of the yes. Jewish world. Right? There's only two types of people in the world, according to the, the Bible. That's the Jew and the Gentile. And the Gentile. And so salvation comes to the Jew first, the scripture says, and then to the Gentile. Yes. And so Peter goes down, has a vision, sees all these unclean things right, rolled out, and all the things that are forbidden for a Jew to eat, according to the Levitical law in the Torah. Yes. And he says, the, in the vision, God shows him all these unclean things, lobster, I don't know what was there, ham sandwiches, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, fast food burritos, maybe. I, maybe don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's in the vision, but says, take, kill, and eat. Mm -hmm. And Peter says, Lord, I can't eat this stuff. This is this is unclean. You know, you, you, I've never touched this in my life. Jews don't eat this. And and God spoke to him and said, don't call... Uh, um, Un unclean that I have called that, clean. That I've cleansed. That's right. Yes. And so Peter goes down and uh, he goes to Cornelius' house, which is a centurion, right, that he's a Gentile. And he goes in there and he's got all his people ready. Peter starts preaching to him, right? He's preaching the gospel to all these Gentiles. Peter didn't think these people could be saved to be a part of the church, that God could help them. Can or you imagine anything. what this did to his brain? This was just a complete brain flip for him. Yeah, these people are unclean. Like, what is happening right now? Yeah. These are not my people. This is not the way we live. This is not how things are done. And yet God is saying, don't you dare call what unclean what I've called clean, you know? So he's talking to him. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted you. I just no, am no. thinking, if I'm him and I'm standing there, I'm like, what in the world is going on? You know, <laughs> what has just happened? But he's in one of the greatest times in history. Oh, 100%. This is, this is 
what brought the gospel to anybody that's non-Jewish? Brought the gospel to us, yeah. right? So while Peter's preaching, just to set the context for everybody, Spirit of God falls in Cornelius' house. All these Gentiles start worshiping God, praying in tongues, right? Spirit of God falls on them. You can see an outward manifestation of the power of God. Wow. And uh, Peter comes back and says, listen, these guys and all the other people that were with him yes. said, hey, these people received the Holy Spirit just like we did in the upper room. And how can we deny them to be baptized in water, which means baptized into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. So now you have all these Jews that have been used to living according to Jewish law, right? Uh, Torah. They're living kosher. That, that's what we would say today. Sure. Uh, and, and there are a lot of rules, a lot of things you got to keep up with. If you understand how the Jew has to live, yes. like we get the, the privilege of getting to travel to Israel quite a bit. Uh, we're leading a tour to Israel here in just a few months. In November, we'll be in Israel again next March. We'll be there. And uh, one thing that always sticks out to me whenever we go to Israel and we're eating. Is how Gentile we are. How Gentile. I mean, I'm totally <laughs> Gentile, right? Yeah. So, so like we get done eating. Used to the first thing I wanted when I was done eating was a Marlboro Red, right? It's like a, smoke them if you got them, boys. Before I got born again, and uh, I got I got rid of you know my my. Smoke. You know I've never smoked a cigarette. You never have. Let's keep it that way. Oh well, I just think it's just disgusting smelling. Well, I, I don't. I can't imagine taking it into my mouth and breathing it in. <laughs> you know, I only smoke in my dreams these days. So I, sometimes when good. I'm dreaming, I still got a pack of Reds and I'm <laughs> just smoking them as fast as I can go. And then I'll think these things. I'm like, what is, here's, here's, here's what I think. I'm like, what, what is, what is the church going to think when they find I'm smoking? I'm their pastor. What, what's, What's Jesus going to think when he, he he knows I'm smoking? Then I'm going to think, well, what's Jesse going to think when she finds out? <laughs> Bad gonna, things. She's going to kill me. You know, every time we walk by someone smoking, our little boy, he's so funny since he was just tiny. You know, I try to like make him like a little more grace filled, you know, as we 100%. like engage people. And so we have little things that we do whenever, you know, because we teach the kids between right and wrong. Yeah, but don't like, be smoking, you'll get cancer. Yeah. And then he, and then I'm like, you know, well, people sometimes they just didn't, you know, they started smoking before people knew. That's becoming an extinct answer. Because like people have known, people forever. have known, and I've been trying some different things on him. And he started every time we walk out of the grocery store. There's like a person standing smoking. He turns and he says, mm, "Bad life choices." Bad life choices. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I have no judgment on you smokers. Smoke them if you got them, but we all know it's bad. For it's us, a bad, right? life, it's bad, choice. For you. bad yes. life choice. Bad life choice. So anyway, so, you were, you, you were saying. You were talking what about. What was I saying? You were talking about cigarettes because oh. I think you were talking about being a Gentile. Well, I'm. I'm just. I don't even know what we're talking about. But the last, the what you used to want to do when you got done with the meal was smoke. First thing you want to do is smoke. Sure. Now, first thing I want to do when I'm done with the meal is I want a cup of coffee. Yeah. And I don't drink cream in my coffee because that's for women and children, right? And <laughs> and guys from the coastlines, not from middle America boys <laughs> like myself. It's for your kind. You've right? never had a latte. I've had a latte, mm, but only pumpkin spice. Let's when confess I'm our feeling one very to another. festive <laughs> in the fall, and I'm Do listening really to like Nora pumpkin Jones. Spice? Just when I'm listening to Nora Jones, and I'm no. taking a hot bath, and Listen, I got the candles burning. I went to Starbucks. That's a chick. No, to the I, max. I went to a I went I to coffee a coffee black. shop the other day, and they had a new latte called an. Apple something, and I tr that is a disgrace. You went to Starbucks. I did. Are you are you an American conservative Christian or what are you? I am. I was in the airport. It was a really early in the morning, <laughs> and I was to trying to survive. But I'm telling you, it was disgusting that those flavors should never be mixed together. Just FYI for well, those. Back to Israel. When you're <laughs> done eating. All right, you want your coffee. You can't have your coffee in the room you've eaten your food. Right. You go to a different room. Because Why? you might put cream. That's right. You might put cream. And there's a law in the Old Testament that says you cannot uh, boil a kid in its mother's milk. You can't mix the meat and the milk. It's non-kosher. Yeah. Think about what a small dietary law that is. You'll walk to the, um, you'll walk to the, if you're there on the Sabbath, you walk to the elevator to go up in the hotel, right? There's a, a kosher elevator. And a lot of these elevators in Jerusalem, that's all there is. And so you can't push a Which button floor? because that would be to work on the Sabbath. That's right. So the elevator stops on every floor. Yes. And I'm talking, it can take a month of Sundays to get down from the 13th oh. floor we had a to the bottom. We had a fiery baptism into law whenever we fir the first trip that we went because we hit on a Sabbath. Oh, yeah. And we were like, what is going on? Everything you were trying to do took longer, wouldn't work. You ha It had to be automatic, all of those things. So it was, it's interesting. But yeah, we've had 
Jewish friends that are kosher. We've had uh, many experiences there, but for the most part, they cannot eat with you anywhere. No, yeah, they can't eat anywhere. They're like bringing their own little like igloo cooler with them, you yeah. know, to eat lunch. It's like a few steakhouses in Dallas in our part of the world, right? Yeah. Very few places that are. I mean, there's more kosher restaurants in Dallas now, but I think about the Midwest. You know, I'm I'm sure Chicago's got some kosher places. Uh, uh, Dallas has some kosher places. Very few though. Yeah. And, and there's only, that's the only place you can eat with them when they're in town. I mean, yeah, it's just it's the crazy. way it is. Uh, so you think about remove yourself 2000 years in the past. Go, let's go back 2000 years. This thing happens. Gentiles start getting born again. They are now Christian. Peter and all these guys say, yes, a hundred percent. They're born again. They're Christian. Now they got to figure out what do they do? How do they get them into church and how do they make it? Okay. Yeah. He's got to build an entry point. He has to build an entry point. Uh, a lot of this is is found in uh, Acts, really Acts 11 is kind of the, the story. Acts 10 is where uh, Cornelius' house, they get born again. And then Acts 11 is where they're there together and um, the apostles start hearing about what's happened. So let me, let me pull this up real quick and we'll talk about... Uh, well, I don't I, like that translation. That, no, uh, like, okay. That we'll, looks like, I don't we're know. We're scrapping that one. Yeah, I'm done with that translation. That was like the Mormons. <laughs> Canceled. The JWs or something. I'm not, I'm not reading your Bible. Mormon spies sneaking into my iPhone here. Uh, so let's go to, to Acts 11. This is what happens. Uh, verse 1 says, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea um, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. All right? And when Peter came up to Jerusalem... Those of the circumcision contended with him, saying... Which were of the law, the circumcision. Right. You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Right? They're like, you can't even dine with people that aren't circumcised. Uh, verse 4. Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, in a trance, saw a vision, an object descended like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered... I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times. All right, Peter had this vision three times. Oh, it happened three times. Right, God had to... Uh, that, that's interesting to me. Interesting. God had to get Peter's attention, number one, and there's something about the amount of times in uh, the perspective of the Jews, right? That emphasizes... It, it emphasizes volume. That's right. So like when you see holy, that's holy. When you see holy, holy, it's it's louder. When you see holy, 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 it's a deafening yeah. tone. It's like know? shaking the foundation. Shaking the foundation. So it's interesting that he says that he saw it three times. I've never seen that until, no. until right now. Verse 10. Now this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa, and called for Simon, whose surname is Peter, um, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. We've been there before, to Simon yes. the Tanner's house. Uh, and as I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as uh, upon us at the beginning. Then I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent. They glorified God saying, uh, then God has also granted to Gentiles repentance to life. It's interesting that they saw the Holy Spirit fall on these people, saw the outward manifestation of them uh, speaking in tongues. Yes. Now, now we believe that's the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Right? You come to faith and belief in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. You're born again. And then there's a set, there's another experience you can have with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon you, and that gives you baptismal power in the Spirit of God to be a more effective minister to others. Yes. And it's accompanied with an outward manifestation of, of speaking uh, speaking in tongues, right? That, that's, that's what happens. And he sees that in them and says, 
God didn't withhold from them. So how can I withhold from them? And it's interesting that God showed it to him in food and saying, don't call unclean what I've called clean. But it also translates into don't call these people unclean when I have obviously marked them as clean. Like God's saying, I approve not just the food. He's saying, I approve these people yeah. to coming into the kingdom of God. And who are you? a sinning human that uh, has kept, you know, the food laws, you think you're good enough, but don't call unclean what I have already called clean. So God is literally giving them the badge. He's, he's giving them the clean badge. Yeah. That that's the story they're made clean. And now they have to figure out what they're going to do with them. So everybody starts finding this out and it becomes a problem. Yes. Right. It becomes a problem for the Jews because the Gentiles are unclean dogs to them. Yeah. Right? It's like all your life you've thought these people are terrible. And now God says, ah, that's your brother now. Right? Wow. That those, These are your people now. It's like being raised in, uh, I don't know, being raised by a Klansman. And God shows up and says, now the black guys, this is your brother and your sister. Absolutely. Right? Or, be, or being raised by a Black Panther. And now it's like, oh, yeah, this this hillbilly is now your brother or your sister. Yeah. I mean, that's mind-bending. It's mind-bending. It, it's, 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 it's shocking culturally. It, it transcends. The gospel transcends so much. So much. And brings people together from all over the world. It's the beauty of the gospel. Well, it, it, no matter where you go in the world, it is so amazing to me. As many cultures and lands and people groups as we've woven in and out of. Oh, yeah. And when you find your brother and sister in Christ, there is no denying it and there's no way to describe it. You yeah. know you found a brother and sister in Christ. You know, I mean, there. once we have received Jesus and he has come at cultural boundaries go down, racial, racial boundaries go down, language barriers come down, like, all kinds of things are crushed under the power of salvation. And that's, it's incredible to watch how God does that. A hundred percent. You know, in your spirit, when you run into them, Absolutely. these are my people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gospel has, has been a blessing to us because we've got international connections we would never have. Never. And it's every race, creed, tongue, culture, you name it. We've been there yes. and uh, we could run into them anytime. And it's open arm embrace and you are brother. Yes. Uh, you have a home anywhere in the world. You have a home. And uh, they can help get you out of trouble. You get yourself <laughs> in trouble. Who gets in trouble? I don't know who could get themselves in trouble. I know a this. man. Uh, but, but Acts 15, if you go forward, there's something called the Jerusalem Council. Yes. And there's these cultural issues. He's got Gentiles doing all this Gentile stuff. Jews that are used to doing Jewish stuff. Now we got them all thrown together and we got to have some rules, right? Yes. Uh, how do you bring the Gentiles into, into the church where they are? And, and so here's what they came up with. Um, this is Acts 15. It says this, uh, verse 19. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols. There you go. All right. Th this is the entry point. He took the whole of the law. Whole of the law. And he's just whittling it down to what is most important that they have to know today. That's right. And, and I, I don't think these are the four only things to be taught in the church. No. But it's an entry point in the most important beginning. I think very, very high cultures. on the list. Very high on the list. Very high on the list this on the what top will of the transform list. your life. That's right. He, he says this. He says, write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Yes. All right? So here, here's what it, here's what it is. It's it's number one. Uh, tell the Gentiles to to not eat things polluted to idols. So the gospel comes into their world where it's highly pagan. Mm -hmm. They're pagan gods. They're worshiping uh, their mills, their markets, right? The grocery stores where they go to buy their food. A lot of that stuff is brought in, and it's a temple type process where the foods itself are offered up to idols. Yes, and then sold to the people. Right. You still see this in cultures all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there's food offered to idols prepared that are specific for the, you know, the idols as, as in idol worship. So that's the first thing he says, don't eat a food offered to idols. Yeah. It's an idolatry issue. Yeah. It's an idolatry issue because idolatry is a big one. Right? 100%. I, it, it, there will well, be no other gods before me. It's we, 10 commandments. You're it's not going to worship it. another God. This is the heart of it right here idolatry. Do not eat because he's thinking, what are they going to run into tomorrow that they need to know to stay clean and undefiled? 
do not eat meat offered to idols. Right. And it's he's really just trying to kill the worship of those other gods. That's right. And let that, them know that there's only one. To. And I think we find this a lot in, in cultures where there is a lot of uh, witchcraft or multiple god worship or whatever it is. Um, you know, for instance, uh, in India, like, you know, they might, oh, yes, I'll accept your god, but I'm keeping these other gods. They'll have 40 gods. And so there has to be a renouncing of every other god to serve the one true and living God and stay on the straight and narrow path. Yeah, you you can't uh, serve Christ in Belial is what it says in That's the scriptures, right. right? Jesus shares nothing with anyone. He is a jealous God. He is the one and only true living God. Yeah. You can't mix it up. I nope. remember meeting a guy that uh, said he was a Zen Buddhist and an Episcopalian. I'm like, hey, <laughs> Those brother. Those things don't go together. <laughs> be a Zen Buddhist and an Episcopalian. You got to pick a horse and ride it. He right? was confused. He's a very confused man. Pick a God and worship yeah. it. Yeah. And that's rule number one, right? No, nothing offered up to idols. Rule number two, and I think this is massive in the church today. Absolutely. Bringing people into the church is flee sexual immorality. I don't think people put nearly as much weight on this. Flee sexual immorality. It was one of the top four big ones that he wanted to give people right when they came into the kingdom. And the reason that I think this is important today, um, you know, I think we opened up the floodgates for sexual immorality decades ago. Sure. When we began to dwell together and cohabitate with people we weren't married to, um, the sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, then just a free-for-all sexually as far as like we gained things like the pill and abortion and all these things so that women didn't have as much reservation about entering into those things in our culture because they were able to take care of it after the fact, the right. morning after pill, all the things that they're putting on the shelf. And so sexual immorality, it became... You know, for girls, some of the reins is like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a baby I have to take care of. So you take that out of the mix and they're not required to become a, a mother the, uh, just because they did The There's it. not the consequence. The consequence is, the consequence, and there's still consequences, but not right, outward. Right, right. Oh, you, you don't like. I'm kicking Leroy. You don't like plan. Leroy. Yeah. Um, but we started years ago checking off on it's okay for people to live together and cohabitate whenever they're in living sexual unclean, you know, things between male and female, if they're not married, it's, you know, if you're an adult and you're able to both say it's okay, if you're, you know, you're in love, we, we gave all these excuses. And even in the church, you know, as our children began to do the same things that the world did, we began to lessen the bar, just kind of lower it, you know? Sure. So decades ago, um, we forgot things like, you shouldn't light a fire in your belly unless it's time for it to burn, like Proverbs says. Or there's a word in scripture called lasciviousness, which is anything that you're doing that births lust. What is lust? Something that doesn't belong to you. So anything that births a desire for what does not belong to you, that's lasciviousness. And it's considered an, a, 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 a top level sin in the kingdom of God. Sure. And we began to just write these things off to just, oh, well, they're, you know, going to sow their wild oats. Oh, you shouldn't get married till you're 30. Oh, and we brought it into regular culture that sexual immorality was okay. And then it just began to spiral out of control. And the next thing we have is all of these sexual immorality issues. I actually wrote my senior paper um, in college on celibacy in the church of the 21st century. I remember that. <clears throat> so, Researching that was eye opening for me because there's all this like religious background to celibacy or staying celibate, um, but not a lot of focus on purity of mind, heart, body. You know what I mean? So, sure. but this was so important that he's saying to them, the apostles are saying to these people, as you come into the kingdom, you need to understand something. The way that you've behaved sexually won't work in this kingdom. Yeah. Sexual immorality goes so much further than most people would say it does. I mean, I, I know people in the United States of America that have gone to specific kind of churches that walk into a church at 25 years old, living with their boyfriend or girlfriend and have no idea they're living in sin until someone tells them. You know, absolutely. Like, like that, that's a very common occurrence. Very they, common. They don't understand that We it's don't sinful. know what sexual immorality is. Right, right. American culture doesn't know that anymore. And if you get out of the Bible Belt... The Bible Belt knows, but a lot of people get a pass there. Yeah. And everybody doesn't know in the Bible Belt now. You go to the coastlines and the big cities, they definitely don't know, and there's been no emphasis placed on it. Uh, but the Scripture, like the Old and the New Testament are Old and New Covenants, Yes, is what they're called. 
So everything's a covenant, which is a binding agreement between man and God. Yes. The highest symbol of covenant on the earth is marriage, which is a binding agreement that we have with each other. And that is that sex is a gift given from God to me and you to be used within uh, a marriage covenant. A man and, and a woman within a marriage covenant. 100%. That God has looked and shined upon, which can only be a male and a female, according to scripture. So now we have all of these sexual immorality issues popping up. We started with just, you know, plain old fashioned homosexuality. Then we got like trisexuality, then, which now is like try anything. Now we have pansexuality, which is like. They're attracted to Tupperware. <laughs> I don't know Pan what. Pansexual. Listen, and the next thing we know, we got people behaving, and people used to laugh when we would do marriage um, counseling. We would say, you know, these are things that are outlawed by God, and we would kind of line them out. And one of those was bestiality. And every time that bestiality came out, people would die laughing. Like, who in their right mind would be involved with bestiality? And now we've got kids in our in our schools acting like animals with How furries. About that? You know, I mean, same spirit keeps coming up. Same to the spirit. Top. It's not a new spirit. It's not a new thing. It's just the same old junk. The devil's not a creative. Right. He's a copycat. It's, it's no pun intended. It's the same spirit. It's no. just a different day. Listen, it in it to me, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, oh my God, this precious kid is made in the image of God. And his mom and dad don't know enough about sexual immorality to rip those furry ears off of him. Yeah, for those of you that don't know what a furry is, a furry is someone who supposedly identifies as a certain woodland creature, be it a cat, a squirrel, a dog, a tiger, or whatnot. And so, you're you're listening to this right now. And you're like, Jesse, Brian, y'all y'all are in a weird spot. No, 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 no. This is happening all over the nation. Yeah, you know, the furry thing, I remember when it first kind of hit the scene. I remember there being a CSI or something like that about yeah. furries, where these furries got together maybe in Vegas. Which and is why you got to watch what you watch, because I am telling you that television defiles people and puts thoughts into them yeah, that they would it. never have. I would have never thought it's about a furry. It's a seed. So no. it shows these people in these, these animal outfits, you know, they're partying in Vegas. And I thought, ah, that's a fad in Vegas. No. That'll be over in a second. Well, now it's manifested itself. It went away for a long time, or at least it wasn't in top of uh, cultural mind. Yeah. Not showed back up in the high schools. And literally some of our public school systems, uh, I call them government school systems. It may be better called communist school systems because they're indoctrinating your children right now. Some of them, because kids self-identify as a cat, they have litter boxes in the school for the kids to go to the bathroom. So we don't hurt their feelings by not accepting who they are. Yeah. All right, that's insanity as a culture that's not going to work. It's wild. Take Christianity out of the thing. But they say it's because they're attracted to furry creatures. Yeah, 100%. You, you, if we would have stomped out the first spark of sexual immorality in our right. culture, these things don't. But every time that the world spun out of control enough where God had to destroy something. Right. Right? Like we see Lot and his wife and she turns to salt and, you know, the whole. Looks back, Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. Yeah. So my kids the other day, they were telling me something that they wanted. <laughs> and I was like, well, we don't do that anymore. Well, why not? Well, we don't partake in that anymore. Why? Because, well, they, you know, they've gone woke and, and, and they're blah, 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 blah. And they're against the the things of God. And I'm giving this, them this explanation of why we're not going to do business with a specific company. <laughs> I can't have coffee because of, it's a lot now, right? Well, I mean, there's so much to boycott. Right. So I'm not yeah. saying we do it perfect, but this has like been a really big deal. And I'll just say it, Disney. I'm not doing Disney. I'm out. I'm out on Disney. Whenever you've got men with beards and princess dresses greeting people um, as they come into the park, I'm out. I'm not gonna confuse my kids. They're not gonna call people that are men women and women men. We're not doing it. Not happening. And so uh and you can have your own opinion, you can do whatever you want, but the scripture's really clear on it, and I'm going with scripture because it's true every time, right? Yeah, so it's insanity. So I was telling my kids and they're like, but we want to go see this specific movie. I said, We can't we can't go see it. Disney Disney put it out. Well, mom, but we, I said, we're not doing it. And I'm sure the others are just as bad. We don't know it yet. You know, I'm trying to figure out and sort through and I'm raising kids. And I said, listen to me. I said, do you think that I do not want to go and see that? It was one of my favorite movies and they've remade it. And I'm an adult now. And I said, I want to go and I want to see it because it was one of my favorite movies as a kid. But you know who else wanted to go back and see something that they had when they were younger? Lot's wife. And bam, she turned to a pillar of salt. Amen. <laughs> and all my kids started laughing. I said, we're not turned into pillars of salt today that so we every time we talk about things that we're standing up for my kids are saying bam she's a pillar of salt you know they they take it to the extreme but i i'm telling you if every time the world was things were destroyed 
people places were taken out. You know, all these things happen. It's because the sexual immorality, one of the biggest things was the sexual immorality was rising to the point of no return. Nobody had any sexual ethics or morals and God burns whole cities down. Yeah. Burns the whole city. Burns the whole city down for things like sexual morality. It matters to God. Okay. So, so the Gentiles are told in, in a lot of the translations, translations say this, preach this to them to flee. Flee it. Like, or run from it. Yes. Run for your life. Like Joseph did. Yeah, yeah. Running from Potiphar's house. This is going to destroy you. You better run from it. And think about our culture. It's gone so far so fast, right? Yeah. We went from, uh, give us, um, you know, and, and you take Christianity out, look at it just from a governmental standpoint. Take the morality out, although you cannot separate morality from government. You really That's a can't. Farce. But let's say take out Christian morality, right? Um, and at first it was like, give us, uh, acknowledge our same-sex partnerships, partnerships, right? So then it went from there to now you're going to, uh, we're not just going to acknowledge same-sex partnerships. Now you have to call marriage same-sex marriage, yes. right? Marriage has never been, there's never been same-sex no. marriage. From from religion, hasn't had same-sex marriage. No. It just hasn't existed. Marriage does not come from governance. It's a, a religious work. Yeah. All right. After that, it was now you're going to agree with our marriage. You don't want to bake my cake. I'm suing you. Absolutely. Right now it's, you're going to call me by the pronouns. I want you to call me. And Even, if you're a church that doesn't have it in your bylaws, I'm going to sue you because you won't do. I'm going to sue the ceremony. Your church. Now it doesn't matter if your scriptures say that I'm going to call you a bigot. Yes. If you won't line up with me, Go, take it the next step. Now we're transgender. And you're going to accept us and call us what we want to be called, even though we're obviously male, dressed like females. Next thing is you're going to let us dance for the little children. That's right. Next thing is you're going to sexualize them. them. The kids are going to dance with us and put the dollar bills in our G-strings. And now they're going to think that they are transgendered and you are going to do a mutilating surgery on their body or you're a bigot and you have no more parental rights because right. you're so bigoted that you can't even care for your own children because you won't let them have a mutilating surgery that changes their body even though they were born with a certain sex organ. And now what have we come to? Parental rights. That's the play. This child belongs to the state, not to you. And that's what they were after since the beginning of the whole thing. It had nothing to do with all of the the sexual immorality. Yeah, the governing part of that goes. didn't care about that. Not at all. Right, right. And I I hate it when people say like they care about us. They, they don't care give about our two rights. Craps about you. They don't care about you. They care about power. That's they right. care about authority. They care about dismantling nuclear families and taking children out from under the authority of their parents because they don't want any authority to be greater than them, which excludes, they have to exclude parents now. And who else do they have to exclude? They must exclude God because God cannot be the king of all kings and the master of everything if they want to be the power that rules and reigns. It's it's an agenda. It's from the beginning of time. And God spoke to it even from the first Gentiles. We call ourselves heathens, right? But the first Gentiles that came into the kingdom of God for such a time as this, he spoke to them as one of the first things he said to them. I'm passionate about this issue because I see that when a child understands that they are made in the image of God, that he cares for them and he cares for their body, that God's best plan is marriage between a, a, a husband and a wife, that his best plan is for children to be born in love for who they are and what he made them, to understand who they are and what their strengths are, that the God's best plan for them is to come into the knowledge of Jesus as their savior and be in a safe environment where that's all taking place and not doctors deciding whether or not they cut their penis off. I mean, it's the balls it, it, or the uh, whatever testicles. The testicles. Or, yeah. I'm just saying cut, cut whatever they're cutting off. Yeah. It, it's, it's not okay. And I see the confusion and well, God, they, do, they do take it all off. Yeah, you're right. God it's, is it's not the author, off, author of confusion. And no. that's all that spreads through the sexual immorality world. How demonic is it to take a little kid? All right. And remove all of its genitalia. I, I said it wrong. I, I was thinking, I mean, I was raised on a stockyard, so I'm thinking about turning, turning bulls into steers, castrating, but they take it a step further yeah. now, right? They're removing both, uh, all of the sex organs and then creating a false vagina. 
right? For you know a male, what is crazy? And it, it'll heal up. They have to dilate it all the time. They have an instrument they have to keep dilating it to keep it from healing up because it's not natural. It's traumatizing. And, and a lot of the uh, European nations have already stopped these type Because they've been doing it longer they've and they're seeing... They've been doing it longer and, and, and these kids uh, don't have children. They're sterilized. Right? A lot of them never have an orgasm. Sexual no experience. sexual pleasure. No do you sexual think, pleasure. Do you think for any... Demonic. It, it's got to be demonic if you get a 20-year-old boy to sign up to never have an orgasm for the rest of his life so that he can be something that he wasn't created to be because he feels like that on the inside. It, it, there's no other explanation I'll tell for you it. what. When they do it to uh, kids below the age... Uh, you know, uh, adult age. Yes. Uh, these people should pay for being a part of this. Well, it's complete they, they, mutilation. It, it's mutilation. It's deviant. It's evil. It's profiteering off of someone's mental illness. That's right. And uh, uh, spiritual brokenness. Yes. And these people should pay for that. Yeah. It, it's despicable. It should be um, prosecuted. And, and this is the thing. I think God, he just loves us so much. And we forget that his plan for us is good and not evil Amen. to give us a hope and a future. That's what it says in Jeremiah. Yeah. And then it says this, it says that if you're tempted in, I think it's 1 Corinthians 16, don't quote me on the chapter, but it's in 1 Corinthians, I believe 16. It says that if you're tempted, that God is so good that he provides a way of escape. So when he says flee sexual immorality, he also says about all sin that if you'll ask that he will provide a way of escape for you. He'll get you that out of he it. He will get you out of it. That he will make a road where there's no road and pave it for you. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's the God we serve because he loves people and he knows that we're weak in areas and he knows that we're simple in areas and he yeah. knows that we are confused in areas. And he says to us that we can pray and he'll provide a way of escape. And then he says to us, flee sexual immorality. Yeah. The, the truth is God's not trying to take away your sexual enjoyment. No. He's trying to give you the highest form of sexual enjoyment. Absolutely. Which is blessed by him in a covenant with somebody you love that's protecting you and is for you. It's going to be there for you in the future. And uh, that's where the greatest sex in the world comes from. So listen, the devil's plan, sexual plan is one of destruction. God's sexual plan is one of blessing and multiplication. Yes. And that's what we want. So, so I think about that, people coming into the church today. We got such broken culture and such broken ide ideological fallacies, right? I mean, it's just all messed up. I think about like my college experience back in the 90s. I mean, it was uh, for everybody, everybody around me sure. in college, right? Uh, it was sexually lewd and people are, are hooking up and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's going on around, but there was still, back in the 90s, there was still some form of restraint, yeah. right? A lot of times the ladies were more restrained uh, than the men were. And there were still some I don't know. There were just more cultural taboos, things that were designed to slow down destructive yeah. behavior. Now I feel like those destructive behaviors, man, the gateways are just opened up. Well, so we this, got this is the difference. We used to think, what will our parents think? Yeah. And now people are twisting it, and it's so perverse that it's like, what kind of parent are you that you wouldn't be supportive of their sexual identity? Oh, or of, of their exploration. Or their sexual discovery or exploration. Like, what kind of parent are you? I'll tell you what kind of parent I am. I am the kind of parent that when you show up from college on your spring break and you tell me, guess what, mom? I tried heroin on my spring break and I loved it. So I've decided to become a junkie. That's what I'm going to do with my life. I look you back in your face and I say, no, ma'am. You're not going to become a junkie. You're a child of the most high God. Amen. You are the head and you are never the tail. You're above only. You're never beneath. You won't be addicted to anything. You'll be free all your life. And I will make sure that you have all that God has called you to have because I've already been praying over you since you were in your mother's womb. And God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And no, you do not get to become a junkie. That is not an option. That's the kind of parent I am. And I think that it's crazy if, if we said to them, guess what? My kid came home and they've decided to become a junkie. 
<laughs> and we're yeah. just going to be supportive of their ex, uh, of their discoveries and exploration. And we're just so proud that they just are an individual and they're going with what they feel is good on the inside. You'd oh, yeah. look at me like I was a lunatic and put me in the loony bin. Sure. Why? Because you'd say, this is not a good mother. This She's lost her ever-loving logical. mind. This isn't logical. She's mentally ill, obviously. Sure. No one would be proud that their kid has decided that for the rest of their life, which might be like three years long at max, is going to be a junkie. Yeah, three months with fentanyl. <laughs> exactly. But for some reason, when it's sexual immorality, and that's what we're dealing with that will destroy not only the soul, but They're the body. They're so so brave. So brave. We're, you're so you're brave. You're the bravest person. I'm I've so ever met. proud of your bravery. You're so no, brave. No, that's not what we do as kingdom people. That. Nothing brave. You get celebrated for doing that in modern culture. Absolutely. Now. That's not bravery. That's you're following the. You're so uh, strong. Yeah. No, you're just following the latest societal trend. That's right. And you are. Uh, you're just somebody that emulates your peers. That's all you are now. And I think um, if somebody's parents looked back at them and said, "Hey, we love you. You are loved." And you are cherished. And God has a bigger plan for you than this. And we just won't settle yeah, for this. Yeah, you're wrong. This is not what we're going to do. But we do love you. But this is not going to be who we are. This is not who you are. Amen. And they begin to speak faith and life and really, you know, change that that narrative. Yeah. It would be different right now. But everyone feels the pressure. If you say what we just said on this podcast, you were sitting in your living room, sitting on, you know, <laughs> where do people use their phone? Bad places, right? Yeah. Uh, but if they're sitting there on their phone listening to it. You're in the car by yourself. And you just got so nervous when we started talking about that. Because the whole world has trained us all to become nervous if we talk about sexual identity. Well, because if you say something about this, you're labeled a big. Yeah. Like I'll watch it when I'm preaching and there'll be a congregation in the rooms full of people. Let's say hundreds of people in the room, yeah. right? I bring up a topic like this and I'm telling you people get nervous as, I mean, they're, they put they're, the brakes they on. put the brakes on and I'll say, look at this. Look at how scared you are all of a sudden. I'm saying what the church has said for 2000 years. Absolutely. And all of a sudden you're scared. Do you know why? You're scared because there's a spirit working in our nation, number one. Number two, there's a psychological operation working yes. right now in our nation. Number three, the schools are indoctrinating all your children on this. Because there is a new temple in America. It's not necessarily the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a new modern woke God temple that is the government school system. That's right. That's trying to break parental authority and break down the, the traditional Christian family unit. That's why we're fighting this. That's why we've got to tell the people when they come to the church... Uh, they must learn to flee sexual morality. Amen. It'll bring them the greatest blessing, the greatest pleasure from the sexual standpoint. God will bless that and there'll be no sorrow attached to it. Absolutely. All right. The, the next two things he talks about, he talks about preparation of food, right? Ba back then there were, there were very big uh, differences in the way the Jews would prepare food and the way the Gentiles would. Yes. And number one, uh, animals had to be, they had to be drained of their blood. Yep. Right. Uh, whenever you killed them, you couldn't strangle them to death. Uh, you know, this is an odd conversation for us to have now, but it was a cultural practice in the Gentile world that at times they would strangle the animals to death and then eat the animals. And that was something that was despicable to the Jew. That's right. Uh, obviously wasn't in the plan of God. Right. I, I think part of it is the way you actually would treat the, the animal itself. Well, I think because... I'm no PETA guy, right? Yeah, but you the Bible says that we should be good to our beast. The righteous man is good to his beast. The righteous man is good to his beast. So there was a standard by which God expected us even to treat the, you know, um, the animals amongst us. That yeah, there you, was an honor to what their purpose was, was to feed, but not to take it violently. Yeah, not to brutalize. No. You, you, uh, you, you if you have to, I mean, we kill to eat. That's the gift of God. Listen, I'm in the cattle industry, right? <laughs> yes. I, I, I background cattle and, and feed cattle. Um, and uh, I'm not a big hunter, but I've been hunting. You know, I've, I've killed animals, taken life like that. For me, and I think for any righteous man, if you have to kill, you want to kill clean. Mm -hmm. There's something on the inside of a righteous person that does not want to inflict pain on something else. Yes. You want to kill it clean. I'll never forget. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I'm telling this. This is me. I get up in, in like, I don't know. It was like, I'd been in bed like an hour. And uh, Brian, it, we live in the country on multiple acres. 
But I look in the back yard and he is squatting with his, like his rifle and he's around in the backyard. I knew we had like a, a what is it called that ruts up your yard? It's every, a groundhog. A groundhog. And I knew we had one and it was just creating this mushy yard. It was awful. We were, tried everything to get it. And and I look out the back window and Brian's crouched down in his underwear and he is, he has Giving his, the neighbors his a show. rifle. We had no neighbors, but he has his rifle and he's just crouched down like he's sneaking like the crocodile uh, that crocodile guy on the crocodile show when we were crocodile young. hunter crocodile hunter and he's like crouched down and he's like going with it and then i see him shoot and i didn't see what happened and then i see brian just begin to weep i mean he was crying and he comes in and i'm like what he's like i found the groundhog i saw him he came above the grass so i was trying to shoot him and all i did was maim him and now he's just maimed and he's just crying as he hurt this poor little creature uh, he's like I, w- I wanted it to quit right in my yard i was willing to kill it oh, kill but it. i yeah. didn't want to hurt it i don't like maiming or wounding no things. i want to kill Sad, him that right? was the you best shoot it, you i'm like it. hey uh you want to get inside mr underwear boy let's go yeah kill it clean uh there's something in that there, there i'm sure there's more theologically there we're not bringing out right yeah. now but but that is a part of it there's something about the treatment of God's creation, absolutely, the way you handle it. And yes, it's here for you to eat. I'm by no means vegetarian. Just came back from eating a, a, a lunch uh, ribeye there for my go. birthday celebration. Yay, Come on, somebody. Happy birthday. 46th birthday. We've been celebrating that for a week now. Uh, <laughs> we keep celebrating the way I've been celebrating. I'll, I'll, I'll need to get a new gym membership. But, but I, I say it's there, but you don't want to do it uh, in a foul way. Last thing it goes on, he says, to tell them to abstain from things Meat with the blood in it. Yeah. All right? So for something to be kosher, the blood has to be drained a certain way. Uh, you don't leave the blood in the animal, nor do you use the blood. The blood's drained. You don't use the blood uh, to make sausages. Yes. To leave it there. And when we're talking about this, a lot of people will think, well, that's like a raw, uh, a, a rare, rare steak. steak. That's not no, the no, no, same. No. That's not the blood in an animal when you look at what's coming out in a rare steak. Yeah. Right? That The blood's been drained out of that animal. That's just um, different proteins breaking down. Uh, you know, you look up the signs of it later, but it's not the blood. Yeah. And and if you go in certain parts of Africa, right, we have a friend that works on staff with us from Tanzania. Mm-hmm. And they'll actually, uh, you know, drain the blood out of a cow, mix it in certain milk and whatnot. Yes. And there are big time health problems that can come from this. Absolutely. Right? It is unclean at the highest level. Absolutely. So they're starting to slow walk the Gentile church. Out of things that could be very unclean. Unclean, pagan, uh, I, you know, all the things yeah. that come from their religions that they came out of. That's right. And they're slow walking Blood them. sacrifice. Blood to, sacrifice. To pagan gods. Absolutely. In the foods as well. Prostitutes in the temples. All the sexual unclean things that the, they were a part they're, of. They're moving them. They're moving them slowly. Yeah. And here's where they start. We're going to move you out of paganism into the worship of the one true living God via his son, Jesus Christ of yeah. Nazareth. And so now we're in a culture that's becoming increasingly pagan. That's right. And the challenge of the church is we're going to have to take kids raised in this pagan world, right? Trained in the in the school system today that's bowed its knee to the woke God. Yes. And we're going to have to walk them out of paganism and walk them into the worship of the one true living God. And they're going to have a lot of questions and they're going to say, hey, that's not right. That's bigotry. That's this. That's this. Because that's what they've been they've been trained to think and to say and to go after. And we're going to have to stand our ground as the church and say, no, this is what the scripture says. This is sexual immorality. We must flee it. God will provide a way of escape. No, this is not clean. We're not going to live this way or eat this way. No, we're not going to treat things this way. You know, we're, we're going to have to stand the test of time. Our preachers have to preach it from the pulpit. Yes. And our believers must not only live it, but be able to give an answer to everyone who asks of them. Not hide, not be nervous, not be, you know, and not be angry or hateful no. either. You can be passionate without being angry or hateful and bring them in. And the Bible promises that they will know we are Christians by our love. And love, a lot of times, looks like a very clear cut explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sure. Love tells them the gospel. Love tells what's sin and what is righteous. Yes. And love embraces people where they are and helps them get closer to the truth. Absolutely. I pray that we all help somebody get closer to the truth and that our churches do the same. 
I want to do that. We know you guys do too. We appreciate you joining us today. We hope this helps. Stay tuned. We've got a few things that we want to show you on how you can support this ministry and everything that we're doing to help the world. I tell you what, um, you uh, are, we would love it if you would just subscribe, push that subscribe button. Share this. Share this with somebody. Make sure that you put it out there so that more people can get more information. We can all go up and life gets better.